Hello and welcome to our webinar where we will learn how machine learning helps Levi's leverage its data to enhance e-commerce experiences. Let's take a brief look at the outline of our broadcast today. We will start with the, with the story of AI as seen from within the organization where most machine learning takes place than anywhere else. We will then transition to our Amazon partner network competency partners, Dataiku, and learn about Dataiku's inclusive AI. And finally, we'll hear, we'll hear from, uh, from our guest of the hour, Levi's, and delve into the fascinating journey of how their recommendation systems evolved from version one to the one that is deployed in production right now. Let's take a look at the speakers that we have lined up for today. Along with me, uh, we have uh, Will Novak, uh, who is a data scientist at Dataiku. Dataiku is an uh, APN competency partner, and as they termed it, it is a match made in machine learning heaven. Dataiku's mission is to provide organizations with technological environment that enables all people throughout an enterprise to use data by removing friction surrounding data access, cleaning, modeling, deployment, and more that allow for successful operationalization. And our guest of honor today is Pallav Agrawal. He is the director of data science at Levi's. Levi Strauss & Co. is an American clothing company known worldwide for its Levi's brand of denim jeans. It was founded in May 1853 uh, in San Francisco and today we'll see that it is also a place where cutting-edge machine learning is being deployed to derive product recommendations in real time. Levi's, as they like to say it, is the original Bay Area startup. And me, I am uh, Chaitanya. I am machine learning specialist solutions architect with AWS and I'll be your host uh, during this webinar. Now let me take this opportunity to set the stage for our deep dive. Customers and partners tend uh, customer and partners choose AWS over other providers because it has more functionality, the largest and the most vibrant community of customers and partners, the most proven operational and security expertise, and business, and the business is innovating at a faster clip, especially in the areas such as machine learning and artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and serverless computing. Machine learning at Amazon has been an active area of investment and research for the last 20 years. We have innovated, improved, and published original work in the area of machine learning for the past two decades, be it in the area of fulfillment and logistics, like in the case of our um, warehouses using Amazon robotics to streamline a package creation, or in search and discovery in Amazon retail, or in topic modeling in lengthy tomes, making content more accessible or the upcoming Amazon drone delivery system, Prime Air, which is fully operational trial uh, operating near Cambridge United Kingdom, or be it amazing natural language processing capabilities of Amazon Alexa or Amazon Go, a brand new retail store concept that is operating across the US. Amazon has been an innovator in the field of computer vision, forecasting, search and recommendations, natural language processing, autonomous drones and applications in retail, amongst other areas. It is interesting to note that, I mean, um, that machine learning has been around for more than 50 years. Most of the common machine learning techniques that we use today were really invented decades ago. What has changed recently is that with cloud computing, AI and machine learning have become accessible to all businesses, not limited to just the major tech giants and hardcore academic researchers. Cloud has removed so many barriers to, the exp to experimenting and innovating with AI that even risk adverse businesses are making it part of their strategies. So we are seeing a tipping point where the recent hype for this technology is transitioning into real impact on business. A recent IDC study estimates estimated that this year, 40% uh, of digital transformation initiatives will take advantage of AI. IDC also predicted that by 2021, global spending on AI and cognitive technologies will exceed $50 billion worldwide. So what's our mission? By the way of uh, deliberate osmosis, we want to enable our partners and customers. We want to take our rich experience with machine learning across Amazon and put it in the hands of all other organizations, every developer, data scientist, and researcher. And how do we do this exactly? 
we are uniquely customer focused we start with the customer need and work backwards 90 percent of aws roadmap is built directly from customer feedback we are unmatched in the breadth of ml services we offer to our customers today we believe customer choice and flexibility are incredibly important we support all popular frameworks and interfaces to give you choice and flexibility we also have the deepest set of security encryption features with broadest accreditations and our approach to r d is fundamentally different and unique our scientists are embedded with our product and engineering teams and we invent and simplify on the behalf of our customers as a result more ml happens on aws than anywhere else why because we have the broadest set of, set and deepest set we have the broadest and deepest set of capabilities. We see machine learning stack as having three key layers. ML frameworks, that is the bottommost layer for machine learning practitioners, researchers, and developers. This includes infrastructure. AWS offers a broad array of compute options for training and inference with powerful GPU-based inf instances, compute and memory optimized instances, and even FPGAs. Then we have the M uh, we have the ML services. Amazon SageMaker removes the heavy lifting complexity and guesswork from each step of the machine learning process. SageMaker makes model building and training easier by providing pre-built development notebooks. Popular machine learning algorithms optimize for petabyte scale data sets and automatic model tuning, enabling developers to build, train, and deploy models in a single click. Finally, we have the AI services which are ready-made for all developers. No ML skill needed. They cover the areas of vision, speech, language, chatbots, forecasting, and recommendations. Now let's talk about the topic of the day. To, uh, topic of this webinar: recommendation. Now let's zoom out and switch gears. Recommender systems were first described in a technical report as digital bookshelf in 1990 by Jesse Carligan at Columbia University. In this report, he talks about how, in a typical bookcase for any reader, interesting documents can happen to be found, often happen to be found adjacently to each other. He also further states that it might be difficult to get people to agree on which books are interesting and which are not, but everyone will find an interesting corner in the bookcase apart from being omnipresent they are also a favorite topic of mine as like you would have guessed by now uh, i can geek out on it for hours i would rather talk about normalized discounted cumulative gain and mean reciprocal rank than anything else recommendations also recommendations more importantly drive about 30 percent of traffic to amazon.com given the amount of uh, traffic amazon.com receives it's actually a very significant number recommender in recommendation engines deal with solving various machine learning problems that apply the solution at scale they typically deal with how to represent real world objects in vector form how to group users together via similar interests how to follow user activity in temporal dimensions and revolve suggestions based on that today pallav is going to take us through a deep dive on the recommendation systems their applications and importance he is also going to talk about evolution of recommender systems as device and how data equal plays an important role in enabling data science teams at Levi's. Data IQ is our APN machine learning competency partner. AWS uh, competency is our global partner program designed to promote and highlight our top AWS partners based on their overall specialization in key AWS solution, workload, and vertical areas. Our goal is to be the most customer obsessed partner program by providing our AWS customers with top vetted and validated partner solutions that can help customers take advantage of AWS products and services. AWS competency partners go through rigorous technical assessment and verification of their expertise specific to each AWS competency. Without further ado, I would like to invite Will from Data EQ to give us a tour of Data EQ's inclusive AI platform. Over to you, Will. Great, thanks so much, Tanya. So as noted, uh, Dataiq is a data science platform that's been around since 2013. So not quite as long as Levi's back in the 19th century, but uh, we've been doing this for a good long time and inclusive AI has been at the core of our mission and value proposition from the start. So as noted, I'm a data scientist at Dataiq, which entails helping uh, our clients and partners get up and running and architecting uh, anything from their data science infrastructure all the way to building out particular use cases, very much like the recommender system that we're going to talk about today. So before we talk about inclusive AI, uh, we should mention this concept of enterprise AI, which is something that is very meaningful to us at Dataiq. So in particular, enterprise AI, as we view it, 
is all about scale. So as you can see, we're aiming to augment 100% of business processes for the benefit of 100% of an organization's employees. So in the past, uh, this idea of siloization is something that I will refer to again and again throughout my presentation today. Uh, in the past, and, and to some extent still in the present, uh, we see organizations far too often being siloed in their work uh, and siloed in their attention to AI and how it can benefit the business. Um, but for us at DataIQ, we see enterprise AI as holding the promise of really augmenting and improving and touching every aspect of the business. And, and we'll talk about how exactly we at DataIQ enable that. But before we do, uh, this concept of data project silos and the individual personas or roles that oftentimes play a part in a data project is one that we should touch on first. Uh, so as you can see here on the left, we have three different personas that we often talk about at DataIQ, namely the business analyst, the data scientist, the data engineer. And of course, there are other individuals that are involved in a data project that I'll talk about a little bit further on. Uh, but this is kind of you know one, one way that organizations might go about thinking about their data project. So you have some sort of analyst, their job is maybe working in SQL or Excel, they're accessing the data, they're preparing the data, they're getting it ready, uh, and then they're typically doing a handoff. Uh, and so that handoff here you can see indicated by red X's. Why do we use red X's? Because oftentimes those handoffs, they're not so seamless. So whether it be um, technically challenging in some way to perform the handoff of assets and communication, uh, or otherwise whether just information gets lost in that process. Uh, the handoff is, is a real risky area. And so at DataIQ, as we'll discuss by bringing all of these personas in one shared platform, uh, we help resolve those handoff issues. But in this case, in the traditional workflow, a business analyst might pass that work then on to a traditional data scientist who may be working using tools such as Python, R, MLlib, Scala, what have you. Uh, and they're really focused particularly on the machine learning modeling piece. Uh, and then once they have some prototype uh, and they have some MVP, also we sometimes see uh, that organizations in their architecture is not set up for the data scientists to push that work seamlessly into production, but instead it needs to again be pushed to a different persona, in this case the data engineer, who refactors the work um, and then we'll push that off perhaps to an API platform. Uh, and so again, this idea of siloization is a risk. Also this idea of exclusive AI uh, where we oftentimes rely on maybe that central data scientist who does indeed have expertise, but they work in a sort of black box, excluded way. Uh, and in DataIQ, we want to really promote inclusion, bringing multiple voices to the table, making sure that everyone understands the white box solutions so that they can add value to the entire organization. Uh, and to, to further touch on all the personas involved, it should be noted that it's not just, as you see in the center, the data analysts, the data engineers, and the data scientists. Of course, in a technical space, as you see on the right, we have IT constraints. So there's an entire fleet of IT individuals, um, whether those be partners, whether if you're using cloud solutions uh, or some local team as well, uh, they need to be involved in data project to be sure. And then of course, as in enterprise AI, we're looking to drive business value and augment 100% of business processes. Of course, we have business leaders, business project sponsors, um, and data consumers, who are all also involved in this process. Uh, and so again, if everything lives in isolation, uh, then there's risk of miscommunication, there's risk of project not going off as so desired, whereas if everyone's on the same page, if communication's more seamless, then we're gonna have an easier time of aligning priorities, which is exactly what we're hoping to enable. To further dwell on this idea here, uh, you can see a quote from John Hennessy, the chairman of Alphabet, who notes that ML is the ultimate garbage in, garbage out technology. So in this case, ML can be garbage in, garbage out, uh, and that's particularly a risk, again, if we have exclusive data science. Uh, if we have individuals who don't really understand the domain, but they just understand the models, uh, then even if the model's high performing, from a business sense, it really can be garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and so to alleviate that, you can see that MIT has spent or is spending $1 billion to start an AI college and their mission is to educate the bilinguals of the future. And so in this case, the bilingual on one part, these bilinguals understand AI, they understand data science, they understand computer science, uh, but they also need to have another skill set. That is, they need to also understand the domain they're working in. Uh, and so at DataIQ, we provide a tool so that individuals with that crucial domain knowledge can participate. And not only can they participate, they're encouraged to do so. 
at Data IQ, this gives you a little bit uh, more detail about how we actually think about this. On the left, you could see an analytics leader managing a team, perhaps of business analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. But on the right, we have a high-level architecture diagram of what exactly Data IQ is doing to enable this. So if you squint your eyes, you can see here we have Hadoop, NoSQL, images, text, voice, whatever your enterprise data store or stores, I should say, plural, we can interact with all of them. We bring in disparate data sources into one central server-based platform where we enable all of these users to communicate, to engage in data management, machine learning, and indeed model deployment. So ultimately we want to drive model deployment to make sure that the organization is getting value from that ML model. And as you see on the right, this can be deployed on-premises or in the cloud. So DataIQ really maximizes flexibility for our clients, and we'll talk about how exactly Levi's has done just that. Lastly, uh, you can see here, if you look from left to right, uh, a typical data science project entails data management, machine learning, and model deployment. And if you follow all the arrows, indeed, you can see that Perhaps if you focus on the purple, the business analyst, the business analyst doesn't just appear once and then disappear, but rather a business analyst in Data IQ might be involved in visual auto data preparation, which you can see on the left. Uh, but at the same time, in the center, you can see that that same business analyst might use Data IQ's visual auto machine learning tools or Data IQ's visual pipeline to be involved in things that were in the past restricted to data scientists or data engineers. Um, in the middle upper left, you'll see the traditional data science role might be doing uh, some behind the scenes coding work in DataIQ, developing what we call plugins uh, to further enable individuals in their organization to do things just like data preparation, just like data visualization, and just like machine learning model building. So all of these roles are constantly involved um, in the end to end flow of a data science project. And so with that, I'll pass along and so we can hear really how this has worked in detail with great success uh, at Levi's. Thank you, Will and Shaitanya, for the introduction and the kind words and uh, also for providing the infrastructure and platforms that has helped us uh, you know, actually build the recommendation systems that uh, improve our customer experience at Levi's. Um, so I'm not sure how many of the attendees uh, are not aware of Levi's, but in case someone's not, um, you know, Levi's has, you know, you all might have be aware of that, you know, is a, uh, you know, is a denim brand, uh, you know, make, you know, products for people across the globe. And uh, uh, along with, our, you know, our wholesale channels, we also have our e-commerce channels where we, uh, you know, have, we can, we can sell directly to our consumers. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is really about how we made the the customer journey more intuitive and frictionless by the use of product recommendations. So, uh, you know, just as a little bit of background, you know, Spotify, which, uh, you know, millions of people use across the world, has this feature named Discover Weekly, where they create a personalized uh, playlist uh, for for each of the or each of their users. And they create, you know, tens of millions of playlists, of, you know, a week and billions of songs have been uh, discovered uh, or billions of songs sort of like have been played uh, due to this and it's one of the most important features that they have and sort of like one of the main competitive advantages that they you know they offer um, Amazon on the other hand uh, you know similarly has a different type of uh, recommendation system and I think most people when they think of a recommender system probably think of something like you know customers also shop for the the carousel that we see below a product page you know on a product page and uh, the amazing statistic there is that about 30% of the product views at Amazon come from their recommendation carousel. And uh, these are examples of some of the best recommendation systems out on the internet. And uh, what they've done is that they've created an expectation for consumers to have a highly personalized experience when they're shopping online or where they're just like, you know, when they're browsing online. And uh, this was actually verified by a Bizarre Voice consumer survey last year where uh, they said that they, 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 they surveyed uh, several thousands of people and what they found was that uh, most people are actually uh, interested or they would like to see a personalized experience uh, when they're on, online, but the number of people who actually experience a personalized uh, homepage is, is, is half of that. So for example, in apparel, which is the, the, the space that Levi's plays in, you know, the, the, the need for a personal experience is about 44% of all consumers who are surveyed, but the actual 
you know, feedback is that people who have experienced is only about 23%, so about half. And uh, the other interesting factoid here is that 38% uh, of the consumers say that they would not return to an online retailer who recommends things that don't make sense for them. So the onus of getting, you know, of getting a recommendation system to work correctly is really on the retailers. And, uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, just checking a box of saying that, hey, I've put a recommendation system online, but it's actually how do we make that customer experience meaningful and really relevant for the end consumers? And so when, uh, you know, as the machine learning team, when we were thinking about, you know, how do we want to enable a, a personalized experience online, we actually found great inspiration in our uh, store associates who, you know, who run off, run off several hundreds of our uh, uh, Levi's uh, uh, brick and mortar stores. And uh, what we do is that we get a lot of feedback uh, from consumers. And uh, one piece of feedback that I would just like to highlight here, because I think it's super relevant, is uh, for, a, for a stylist named Tanner. Um, and the feedback was, Tanner was super friendly and helpful from the moment we walked into the door. He was very knowledgeable about the different styles and helped me find exactly what I was looking for, even though I wasn't expecting to find it. He made the experience so much better and I found some amazing pieces. Thank you, Tanner. Um, now, really what we tried to do was that we looked at this feedback and several other, this is just you know one sample that we picked from thousands of such feedback that we get on a daily basis. And really what we were trying to think of it as that, you know, ideally our recommender system online should be one that even you know, somebody use it, uses it, would give similar, they would, they would give similar feedback to it. Instead of Tanner, they would say, the Levi's recommendation engine was super friendly and helpful. And so what we tried to do was we tried to isolate what are the key, uh, you know, attributes of a good consumer experience. And I think one thing that we found was, I think what's highlighted in yellow here is that it was super friendly and helpful. So primarily it has to be helpful. Uh, you know, the system has to um, have the knowledge embedded in there of the products. Uh, it should help the consumers look, uh, find what they're looking for, but it should also have an element of serendipity where they might be, able, the consumers might be able to find something that they might not know they wanted. And uh, we did some uh, consumer insights surveys and did a lot of testing to then uh, really uh, nail down the five most important qualities that makes a recommendation system good and uh, you know, really enables a good personalized experience for the end consumer. So the first one is that the, the recommendation system should make the consumer journey intuitive and frictionless. Um, the, the end goal, uh, I think a lot of times when, you know, when companies uh, look at uh, recommendation systems, they focus a lot on metrics like you know, accuracy, mean, ac mean average precision, NDCG, et cetera. But really the, the core metric that we should be looking at is that how, how much friction is this recommendation system is this producing for the end consumer? So for example, when you land on a homepage at a website, you know, you want to be, you, you're, la you're landing there with some kind of intent. Now your intent might be to shop for yourself, to shop for somebody else, might be just to like price browse, whatever, right? You could have any number of intents. How easily can I get to you to, uh, to your goal? And how easily can I, you know, get you from point A to point B through the recommender system should be the main uh, focus of a good recommender system. The second quality is that it should reflect and communicate the brand's, uh, the organization's brand values. And what I mean, what we mean by that is that uh, we should not let the, uh, you know, a lot of times when we deploy algorithms, those algorithms are optimizing for some metric. Again, that could be accuracy, you know, conversion, whatever. But in, in, the, in the pursuit of optimizing those metrics, we should not forget uh, the brand values and how the brand chooses to communicate with the consumers. Because at the end of the day, a recommendation from a recommendation carousel should feel like an expression of the brand. And it should feel like something that the brand itself would recommend, recommend to people. Uh, the third quality would be that it should really focus on what consumers want and not on who they are. And so a lot of uh, recommendation systems try to, you know, uh, have the experience of, okay, tell me more about yourself. Like, you know, what's your age? What's your location? You know, and it tries to collect a lot of information about consumers. Um, and I think that while that is useful, it's still not an individualized experience because if you think about the points of information I can capture about somebody, let's say age, location, gender, there are probably for any such combination, there are thousands of people like that. So just that itself may not be necessarily what's super useful. What might be more useful is that we, if the if the recommend system is able to understand what is it the consumer wants to do and then help them get to that faster. It should be able to also utilize both implicit behavioral markers and also take in explicit inputs. And 
uh, and then also it should be able to provide relevant information in a timely manner to expedite decision making. And really what at the end of the day, the, the decision to make a purchase is on the consumer. And a recommendation system, like, you know, when it works well, should be one where it can provide that relevant piece of information uh, that the consumer wants that then helps them, you know, make the decision that whether they want to, you know, buy this product or not. And if we can encompass all these qualities, then we would then basically from from the, from our team standpoint at Levi's, we feel that we could actually build a good recommender system. And so let's take a quick uh, view of how we actually evolved and how we went through the process of building, uh, you know, a really good recommender system in-house. So the story starts, uh, you know, several years ago uh, when we deployed a recommendation, uh, recommendation carousel from a third-party vendor. And uh, we, it was on the website, and I think uh, it did fairly well. Uh, but when we did some consumer insight studies, what we found was that certain areas for the recommendation experience stood out as uh, a negative for the end consumers. The first one was this, uh, the title, which says, recommended for you. And one of the most common pieces of feedback that consumers gave was, why, why is it recommended to me? And what, based on what information about me is this based on? And this actually, you know, in the recent times when privacy has become more, uh, more hot button topic and more relevant for our consumers, uh, you know, based upon what information becomes a very important question. And right now this is, the title did not necessarily explain that. The second thing that you might notice is that, uh, you know, as a denim company, obviously we recommend a lot of, we sell a lot of jeans. Um, and then you see a male jean, a male jean, and then suddenly a female jean appears. And then it, then it's again followed by male jeans. And so uh, consumers, and this was a common experience and consumers were often confused as to why, you know, if it's saying that this is recommended for me, if it says recommended for you, right, uh, why would it show me um, a, a female gene, a gene if, I, if it thinks that I'm actually a male? The other thing that was actually uh, really rather um, sort of unfortunate was that it, it would show expensive items along with discounted items almost next to each other. So as you can see, we have some products which are discounted and some products which are, you know, uh, you know, full price. And uh, one of the things like, you know, when we talk about sort of the brand voice, you know, when somebody walks in to your store, or uh, when somebody lands on the homepage, they're coming in the store with an intent to purchase and then just showing them like discounted products at that point is not really the best, most elevated brand experience. So that was also one of the things that our, our brand partners uh, within the company uh, wanted us to change. And so the V1 architecture sort of looked like this, where we would uh, effectively make, an, make a call to uh, an endpoint, uh, and then that would uh, send us recommendations back um, every time somebody landed on the website. The, the issue there was that it was not very configurable from our standpoint. If we wanted to make changes to the behavior of the recommendation carousel, we could not. The other thing was that there was a 24-hour uh, lag time uh, for uh, for the recommendations to be updated to a person's browsing behavior. So let's say I land on the website today, um, you know, uh, the, the recommendations will only be, uh, rec you know, personalized to me tomorrow. Now, if you think about it, most shopping sessions probably don't last 24 hours. People probably browse on their phones or their laptops or whatever, and then maybe they shop for a few minutes and then they move on to something else. And if we can't really capture them uh, in that, during that session, the opportunity is lost. And so we really wanted to move away from this uh, from this 24 hour uh, lag time and the lack of adaptability. And hence we decided we want to build something in house. So the first approach we took was uh, to look at using Amazon, Amazon's Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch service. Now Elasticsearch, as the name suggests, is actually a, uh, is a, is an, is a tool that's primarily meant for uh, enabling search you know just like like you know for example google enables web search elastic search uh, helps you it's a it's a platform that helps you enable search on you know on a website or any tool really and if you think about it um actually recommender systems and uh, search are both and search engines are both actually part of the same class of algorithms which are in the information retrieval family effectively um, recommendations can be thought of as a learning to rank problem where what we're trying to do is that we're trying to say that based upon what you know, what I know about a consumer, based upon their browsing history, based upon their shopping history, et cetera, you know, what are the most important uh, products that might be of interest to them? So I think going back to Chaitanya's point about library books, if I know what books you have read, what are 
you know, if I had to sort the list of books for you that might be most relevant, you know, how would I, what would be the right order to sort them in? And so search engines and recommendation engines effectively try to solve the same problem. And so we thought, you know, maybe Elasticsearch is a good way to start because it's it's a it's a great search engine and it's you know really uh, meant to solve the learning to rank problem. And so we started off with that Elasticsearch. And uh, what would happen is that our product attributes would come from Hybris, which is where our product catalog is stored. Um, and then Elasticsearch would, uh, you know, we would use different algorithms uh, within Elasticsearch to then, uh, you know, use the product descriptions as the document and uh, try to find similar products based upon the, you know, the tokenized product descriptions. Now, this experience itself, uh, I think, when we looked at it, it was, I think it was a good proof of concept, but there were a number of issues with it. The first one was that there was very little adaptability because again, we were using something out of the box and to us to be, for us to be able to make any changes on top of it, we had to write a lot of uh, code that would uh, take the recommendations from Elasticsearch and then rank it ourselves. And that wasn't necessarily the best thing. The other thing was that um, uh, product recommendations, for, uh, sorry, uh, product descriptions uh, are, you know, themselves don't change very much, but there are other attributes, for example, like the price of the product, which does play, uh, you know, quite a bit into the the relevance of whether the product is, you know, related to one product or not. Then there are other attributes like color and there are attributes which are not necessarily contained in the product description, which then become a little bit tricky for us to incorporate as to that, you know, what is the importance of a specific attribute uh, as compared to a different one? So whether the color of a gene as an attribute is more important than let's say, the, the leg opening for that gene. And so what, what happened was that Elasticsearch itself was not, out of the box, was not necessarily the right solution for us. And um, so then we moved on to the next uh, version, the next architecture, which uh, as you can see is getting significantly more complicated. Um, uh, in this stage, we basically uh, set up an Amazon API gateway that would connect with our uh, the front end from the website, which would then, every time we received a request from the front end, would write that into DynamoDB um, which would uh, once, you know, DynamoDB, you know, I think it's primarily used as a database, but it also has a queuing system. We use that as a queuing system to then trigger a, a Lambda job that would uh, talk to Redis, which is uh, uh, where we're using Elastic Cache on AWS to, uh, to actually retrieve the recommendations and then send them back to the end user. Um, how we actually implemented it was we, again, used the same thing where we would take the product catalog from Hybris, replicate that into Amazon Redshift, uh, we would run different algorithms in batch on Amazon EC2 that would, uh, you know, perform the, the matrix factorization, the collaborative filtering, and then generate the candidates uh, for, you know, for each, the candidates for, for, for the candidate recommendations for each consumer, and then we'd write that into Redis. And then as the consumer would shop, we would get the clickstream data through segment, which is basically a online analytics platform that would uh, help us uh, understand what the real time, uh, help us understand in real time what the customer browsing behavior is like. We would uh, push the events into an SNS topic that would uh, be sent to another Lambda uh, project, uh, sorry, process, that would then write the, you know, the the, the consumer shopping uh, clickstream data into Redis itself. And Redis was really like our primary database as well as our cache. And then this uh, this process here would uh, parse the, the consumer history shop a clickstream data and then rank the the, the relevant uh, recommendations and then push them out. So our Amazon EC2 process was doing the candidate generation and the uh, the Lambda process here was doing the actual ranking in real time. And then those were sent out back to the to the front end. Now, uh, some of you who might have worked with Amazon, uh, you know, uh, products might notice that we, you know, this, 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 there are some inefficiencies in this process, and that was primarily because we were trying to put together something really quickly and trying to use technologies which we thought sort of were, you know, would would sort of get us get us unlocked really quickly. And uh, when we tested this architecture out, it actually worked quite well, uh, but there were some issues with latency, uh, especially with uh, lambdas. And one of the things with lambdas is that they have a, a, a cold start problem. So for example, if a Lambda is being fired consistently, then then you know the, the response times are actually in the milliseconds, but if the events stop coming, then you know you have to warm up, you have to keep the, the Lambda warm for it to be able to respond to requests within milliseconds, otherwise it can take up to many seconds. And what was happening was that because the requests were taking 
longer than we would want them to, uh, the front end uh, was timing out and then you know our error rates went up. And because of that, we basically moved to the latest architecture, which uh, is a little bit of an eye chart, and I apologize for that, but that's really sort of an indication of you know the kinds of complexity that comes into the picture when you're trying to deploy something yourself. Um, and really what we're doing here is that we we take our uh, our data, transaction data from our order management system and then you know our product catalog from Hybris and then use DMS uh, data, uh, Amazon DMS to then write that to Redshift. Um, we then uh, have multiple algorithms actually running on top of uh, Redshift. So all these yellow cubes that you're seeing here, these are all different algorithms which are running on EC2. Uh, which are sort of doing the candidate generation, but using different algorithms. Um, on the on on you know on similarly as to the past experience, we have the segment webhook that uh, gets the real time browsing data in. We write that into Redis, uh, which again is Elastic Cache, uh, where all the candidate uh, recommendations are stored here. And then from that point on, uh, you know we have an Amazon ALB instance, which uh, basically powers the web server, where we have a Flask server. Uh, with waitress on top of it to uh, you know uh, serve the request where we uh, do the lookup for each consumer and uh, return the request to them now the the you know even so the question could be you know i think one of the th first things people ask when they look at it is that you know why did we go this route and a big part of it was to have the flexibility that uh, you know that we need to make changes uh, for example if if we get feedback from our business users if we get feedback from our consumers as to uh, you know, if they want a different experience, we are able to change this very quickly. There's nothing here that's sort of uh, that's limiting us in any way. We're not using anything out of the box necessarily. We are kind of uh, using a lot of things. Uh, you know, uh, we are we are kind of like building a lot of things from scratch here to give us that flexibility. Um, and uh, the other thing is that it helps us support multiple algorithms that would help us, you know, create different types of candidates and. We'll talk a little about those algorithms in in a moment, and the core value here is that you know there is no one size fits all algorithm that will create the right recommendations for every each and every consumer. And um, you know what what we're doing in our in our in our actual uh, web service is that we we look at what the consumer behavior has been, what they have been uh, browsing, and then use that information to then um, rank the uh, rank the candidates in real time and uh, and that really has helped us you know not only create business value but it also help, has helped us scale for very high traffic uh, times when you know we have for example during sales when, when we do promotions and sales on the website when the traffic goes up it, it scales uh, the ALB helps us scale uh, pretty linearly and uh, you know we can actually switch out and add or modify algorithms as and when needed it, it makes it it makes it super flexible Plus, our response times have now actually dropped significantly to 250 milliseconds, and so our P95 latency right now is 250 milliseconds, which is faster than most web pages can load in the in any way. And our error rates have gone from, you know, some very high number to like less than 0.2% or something. So it's almost gone now. And you know, so that's so that's really the power of you know, I think I would say using something as flexible as the Amazon infrastructure, where uh, we can sort of pick and choose the components that we need and then uh, use them, build them ourselves. And the other cool thing that happens with DataIQ is that all these boxes here, all these cubes, we can test all these out in DataIQ and uh, see which one actually works for us. And when we test it out, then we can, you know, if it works for us, then we deploy it in production, which is like a super easy process because it's really just, you know, effectively it's promoting something that lives in DataIQ onto EC2. And so our, 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 uh, our code release and change, <clears throat> sorry, code release and change management process becomes very much simplified. Uh, because the DevOps people can also look at uh, what's actually running on on DataIQ, they can you know do their own performance testing there, and then sort of give the green light to say that okay, this actually works, and you know you can use it. So uh, let's look at uh, some of the you know let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into these cubes, these little cubes, uh, and the algorithms that we are powering, and let's look at how they manifest uh, on the front end. So the first one is a popularity-based recommendation model which as the name suggests, it's really recommending the most popular products to people. And the way it works is, you know, we, we look at uh, what people have, um, have viewed, what they have liked, what they have added to cart, what they have purchased, 
what they might have shared with people. We have many different um, markers of intent from consumers. And then what we look at and see is that, okay, person A um, has like, you know, has expressed interest in a donut, in a cupcake and a croissant. Person B has also shown an interest in a croissant, uh, uh, you know, a soft serve and a, a, a cupcake. So the most popular items here, as you can imagine, are a croissant and a cupcake. And those then get recommended to all of our other customers. And so it's a very simple algorithm, nothing, no magic happening really. There's, um, I mean, uh, it's, it's as simple as it gets, right? And uh, so we use this algorithm when uh, somebody lands on the web page for the first time and we have no idea who they are, we have no browsing history, they have not logged in or anything of that sort. And so what we do in that scenario is that first we change the title to say recommended bestsellers. What that does is that it clearly articulates the source of information. So the people, so the consumers can actually understand why is it that we are recommending these, these products to them. Uh, we also uh, do location-based segmenting uh, where, for example, the moment you land on a website, you know, you, you know, your IP address is recorded, which can help uh, sort of roughly geolocate at a, at a city county level where sort of where you're coming from. And what we do on our back end is that we look at sort of what the weather is like, what might be the trends in those in that region, and then use that to then recommend sort of bestsellers for that region. Um, as you can imagine, for example, um, in Europe, uh, you know, somebody who lives in Spain probably dresses very differently from somebody who dress who lives in uh, in, in 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 Norway or Sweden, right? And so we want to make sure that you know we we take into account the, the regional preferences and then recommend bestsellers there so this uh, when i took the screenshot uh, from the back end basically this was uh, uh, from somebody who was in a colder climate this is a few months ago older so this was before we were having massive heat waves across uh, you know the the world um, the northern hemisphere i should say the other thing that you would see is that you know we show the men's products first and then the women's products after that, so that there's no confusion as to why products are sorted randomly when people land on the website. The next algorithm is called association rules mining. And this is, uh, I would say, the workhorse of recommended systems, I would say, for the longest, since the, since the time that, uh, you know, these uh, recommended systems existed on the web. And uh, uh, it's also a fairly uh, simple and straightforward algorithm. Uh, what it looks at is what items tend to get purchased together. So for example, you know, uh, it looks at shopping carts of, of people. So when you look at the cart, uh, it, it sees that, you know, person A purchased a donut, a cupcake, a croissant, and a soft serve together. Person B purchased a donut, uh, a, I think probably a cupcake, uh, a croissant, and a, and a chocolate cake. So what it finds is that, oh, it seems like a, a croissant and a donut tends to get purchased together more often than other products do. And so the moment uh, somebody lands on the website and they show interest in a, in a donut, it'll recommend a croissant to them. And that's effectively how this whole, whole thing works. And obviously I'm simplifying it uh, slightly, but uh, you can think that's at a high level, that's really how it works. And so we use that for people who have uh, just landed on the website and uh, have started browsing, but haven't really logged in or have not really identified themselves in any way by adding items to cart or, you know, just, they're basically just browsing. They have not done any sort of high intent uh, uh, behaviors. They have not shown any high intent behaviors. So uh, our headline then changes to say, because you shopped similar styles. And again, this is also uh, the key intent here is to very clearly articulate that it is, this is based upon your shopping behavior of the, the styles of products that you have viewed. So we try to keep it very intuitive and very, you know, sort of keep uh, the headlines very simple. And uh, we actually talk, we actually tested a lot of uh, different variants with our copywriters and uh, teams to like make sure that this is the most simple uh, and intuitive uh, tagline. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, getting, uh, you know, getting these resolved as well. And as you can see here, this person had actually browsed a mix of women's tees and jeans. And hence we are showing them uh, other products, which not only leverage the association uh, association based rule mining but also then helps uh, you know some outfitting options like so what we see is that this jean and t-shirt pair tends to go really well together this uh, this t and jean also tend to go well together and this product is also similar to some of the things that they've used so it helps us you know based upon uh, association rule mining it helps us get to similar products um, or, or find other products that might help them you know as an, in an outfitting to like create an outfit 
Um, then the next thing that we have uh, is our item to item similarity based recommendation model. And I would say this is like the workhorse for, for us at Levi's. This is where we tend to get most of our uh, most Im number of impressions of the of the recommendation carousel, and this is where like we find most people end up following and sort of ending up more, end up creating most value. And uh, really, what it is is that it it you know at a very simple level, it looks at you know this person has shown interest in a donut. A donut is similar to you know a, a cupcake and you know a cake, for example. Uh, a croissant, on the other hand, is a savory item. And uh, so that's not similar to a donut, uh, where versus like a, a soft serve is similar to a macaron or macaron. I don't know. I, my French is not great. Um, and so what happens is that if you're interested in items which are sweets, which are sweet in nature, then I might recommend other items which might also be dessert items, which might be sort of like sweet items. And so really uh, at the core of it, what we're trying to do is to say, you know, what attributes does this product have? And what other items exist in our in our in our catalog which have similar attributes? And so the way we look at it is to uh, sort of so when the person uh, lands on the website, this is the kind of experience that they get. Firstly, it says inspired by your shopping. So again, we clearly articulate why this product is, rec is being recommended to them, and you know it you know it's it's really meant to say that you have shopped these products, you have at you know shown interest in these products. And we want to show you other similar products that are, you know, based upon what you're viewed. Um, so this person has actually browsed, uh, when we took a screenshot, this person has actually browsed uh, girls' teas. And uh, the common attribute amongst those teas was, so girls meaning like, you know, little, like uh, uh, kids between the age of four to seven years old. Uh, uh, well, the, the prominent feature in them was that they were on a, uh, like sort of a, a monochrome background with a prominent Levi's logo in there. And that was a common feature between them. And so as we can see is that, you know, most of the time prominent, uh, you know, when you look at monochrome uh, t-shirts, like they tend to be white or black. And, uh, you know, wh what we noticed was that, you know, we, when we started, when we build the recommendation system for, you know, initially, it would, you know, find similar products. And let's say if they browse a number of white tees, it would recommend just other white tees as well with, you know, with prominent logos. But when we actually tested it out, our merchandising team came up with the feedback, which is that, you know, on a white background, showing white tees creates like a very sort of uh, uh, sim like it, 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 it's a, it's a very monotonous experience, and it does and uh, we need to add some visual breakpoint to create some visual interest. And so, hence, what we did was that we added a di diversity metric in our a product diversity metric in our in our in our ranking uh, algorithm that would ensure that there is some diversity. Of products where it's not just you know white teas on a white background. We actually add a a black tea which sort of breaks the sea of white uh, uh, in the in the in the recommendation carousel, and that actually ended up testing much better than previously. So I think some of you might be wondering as to like you know how how might how are we actually capturing these kinds of attributes? How are we capturing these visual attributes? Right? I mean monochrome background and the logo and color, etc. So they're really uh, they're really uh, three ways that we're doing it. The first one is to look at product attributes directly. So, you know, right now, this is, let's look at this gene, for example, that this model is wearing. This gene has a specific name. Uh, it's It has a gender, you know, it has its material attribute, et cetera. So there's a number of attributes for this gene. And uh, what we can do is that, you know, is that we can try to plot each gene on, you know, on these attributes. Which gives us sort of like you know on if you think about it on a two by two on a on, a, on, a, on like sort of on two dimensional plane, if we plot uh, the rise of a gene, which is like how high up does it go on your waist uh, on the y axis, and if you plot the cotton content of the fabric on the x axis, we can plot each each product that we have on this two dimensional axis, and then let's say this this pink point is the the anchor product, the product that the the person is viewing. We can then sort of draw a bounding circle around it and say that you know show all the products which are within this bounding circle as similar products. So similarly, you know we could do something for the leg opening, whether this is like a boot cut gene, which is like has a very broad leg opening at the bottom, or if this is like a skinny gene, which is like in a really you know where it's a very narrow leg opening on the y-axis, versus the wash. Like is it like a light colored gene? Is it a dark colored gene? So again, we can plot you know all the products in these two dimensions and then say this is the product that the person is at. You know, you can draw a bonding box and get uh, similar products out of that. 
Now, this approach itself, I would say, you know, works to a certain extent, but it runs into problems really quickly. The first one is that we end up with what we call a sparse matrix, sparse feature matrix, where a lot of products will end up having uh, the feature values as zero um, and because you know we have such a large number of products that we that we carry not everything will have uh, uh, you know an attribute value that's you know specified for it and the sparseness uh, first of all like when we try to do any kind of collaborative filtering on it creates a bunch of problems like it becomes very very sparse the other problem is the cursor dimensionality what this means is is that you know if you have basically uh, you know b dimensions or or you know or n dimensions you need something to the power of you know you need something to the order of like n to the power of 4 uh, number of pro uh, products uh, or or data points to actually be able to you know uh, find similar products right because what happens is that as your number of uh, dimensions increases the ability to find similar products which based upon just you know euclidean distance uh, becomes harder and harder and then you know a little bit of noise here and there can actually end up causing a lot of problems there so we had to get get across this cross dimensionality and reduce the sparseness and hence what we did was that we looked at uh, ways to get uh, image embeddings uh, that will uh, re not only reduce the number of dimensions but also uh, uh, you know reduce the, the sparsity of the of the of the, of the feature matrices so image embeddings sort of as a concept has been around for I would say uh, for a few years and it's like becoming almost like industry standard these days um, and uh, the way it works is you know you have uh, you know take any large pre-trained network you know like VGG you know ResNet AlexNet this there's so many networks. there's an entire model zoo out there right you can take any of these uh, networks and when these networks are trained their core objective is to classify uh, you know what is in the image, the object in the image, right? So in this one, uh, this uh, this network classifies it as you know a panda or a raccoon or something, and uh, each classification comes with a level of accuracy. Now this is happening. Uh, this accuracy is this classification is happening at the softmax layer, which is the is a is the is the final layer of the network where you know these the initial phases of the, of the initial layers of the network are trying to extract some generic features about the the, the object, and the later uh, latter parts are trying to combine those features to find a meaningful representation that can be fed into the softmax layer to then get the the class probabilities. What we do for to get image embeddings is that we actually chop off the the softmax layer, and then just take the uh, output of the of the penultimate layer, which is indicated in blue here, and this actually ends up giving you this uh, this vector. It's like a series of numbers. That you can then use uh, to sort of like either use the Minnesota reduction uh, using any of this the TSNE PCA UMAP techniques to then sort of uh, reduce it to three dimensions and then just do uh, cosine similarity on it, or you could just use the dense vectors di directly to use cosine similarity, or you could do something on the order of locality sensitive hashing or different other you know other different uh, or Levenstein distance or anything else that you want to then get a uh, distance between products. So what that looks like sort of on a on a on an applied basis is that let's say you are uh, this, this, let's say this is a product that the consumer is viewing uh, at any, you know, on the web page, and this product has its own embeddings, these, the, this vector of numbers, and um, I, you can think of it, these embeddings, as almost like a zip code for a product. Now, a zip code by itself, you know, is a bunch of numbers, which by themselves don't really mean anything. The value of a zip code really comes in uh, in telling you what other zip codes is it close by, uh, are close by. And really, it helps you figure out the distances to other zip codes. So it's really all about the relative position of this product uh, in conjunction to its, uh, in, in in relation to its uh, to its neighbors. And so let's say this product has this this uh, zip code, and what we can say is that oh, this other product that we see here uh, has this other uh, you know vector, which is, let's say is another zip code, and the distance between these is 0.1. This other product here. Um, is you know let's say the distance is 0 0.3, this is 0 0.4, and this is 0 0.6, and this is actually this is an actual real output from our algorithm. This is not like I'm just it's not a made up thing. Uh, and I think you can look at it for example like you know this product has some couple of you know a little bit of distress uh, which are the holes here in the in the knee, and you can see this other part which is more similar also has holes but um, and is also like a cropped uh, is also like a cropped fit and also has like a wider leg opening. This one has a significantly more distress, but um, you know, as compared to this other gene, uh, that's why the distance is a little bit larger. But the 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 color of the gene and the sh and the the leg opening are also very similar. 
and so they're effectively like you can like you, know, you can look at these and then kind of like make meaning some sense of like what might be happening there and so that's what we so how do we create that so what we did was that we used uh, resnet which is like you know a popular large network um which you know sort of is used to you know classify objects you know on the image and data set we we inst and so we took the network and uh, we froze the weights of all the layers in resnet and uh, you know added our own uh, dropout uh, dense dropout layers um, on top of it, on top of the, we removed the softmax and then added it on top of, added our layers on top of the, the penultimate layer, and then fed our own data set with only about 10 categories of genes, jackets, et cetera, and gave the task for it to classify whether this is a gene, whether it's a top, whether there's a short, and then once we got a uh, good enough uh, sort of accuracy at K, uh, um, you know, when we found that it was doing fairly well there, we basically chopped the softmax layer off and then get the embeddings out of the final layer. Um, so that's one way of doing it. The second, so the, sorry, that was the second way. The first way is that you know is to use the uh, is to use the product features. The second one is to use visual similarity using the the computer vision algorithms. The third one is to actually use the the document similarity. A document here is the is the product uh, is are the product description and uh, we basically, uh, you know, take the product uh, description into uh, as as an input, put it through a TF-IDF, uh, a vectorizer, and then get you know sort of an, again an embedding for the document. And TF-IDF is basically um, a way to uh, find out what words in this specific product description stand out, and which uniquely help us identify a specific uh, product description over another one. Uh, so, like for example, words like the and a. You know they occur almost in all documents, so they don't they get a very low weight. But if a document a word like puppy shows up, then that's a rare word, uh, and then that sort of characterizes the document, so that gets a higher weight. So we can do exactly the same thing. We get the embeddings, and uh, we can find similarity, uh, and then we can also use word to vec, for example, to then say that what are other similar words uh, that can help us uh, locate uh, similar documents and similar products. The thing with word to vec though is that word to vec was trained on. Uh, uh, sort of on a on a on a standard Wikipedia corpus, uh, but our corpus is actually significantly different because we have terminology that is not necessarily commonly used. So, for example, if you entered the term high rise in Word to Vec, you would get uh, similar words uh, which would be skyscraper, buildings, etc. But in the denim side, high rise actually means a specific type of gene which goes up, uh, you know, you know, quite significantly above the waist. Um, and that's a very popular fit. So we we, we have to you know we have to be able to identify it correctly. Uh, similarly, whiskers, on the other hand, uh, mean something else. Like you know, which like you know, it's like considered like you know, but on, on a gene, it's this it's this creases that you know come with wearing the gene often, right? So those whiskers are these patterns need to be um, identified as well. So what we did was we actually trained our own uh, custom word embeddings, and for that uh, we again took. Uh, a standard language model, uh, which in this case was glove embeddings. And then the, the way the language model, the, what you do is that you basically uh, train it, on, you take the pre-trained model and then you try to predict the next word. So you start it off with a prompt, let's say by saying that this gene is, and then you try to see how well it can do in terms of predicting what the next words are. Um, and then once you do that, then it actually trains upon these embeddings and it can give you like very similarly to how image embeddings works, like you know, other products which are similar to this new product. And the last one is collaborative filtering. Uh, you know, again, this is again very standard algorithm, and this is primarily based upon understanding, you know, if you have bought certain items, and then you know, then looking at who, who, which other consumers are there out there who might have purchased similar items, and what else have they purchased, and then recommending that for you. And so effectively, it uses a matrix decomposition method where if you have not uh, purchase or shown interest in certain products, but other people have, then it finds other people who have similar taste as you and then recommends products based upon that. And how that ends up looking is um, on the uh, on the on the experience side is that it says because you bought similar styles. And again, we try to keep the information, the source of information very clear. And then uh, this person actually had purchased a lot of different uh, men's and women's products, but they primarily purchased uh, denims. And so we first recommend a graphic tee and then for women and then uh, recommend other graphic tees for men. And this was primarily because of the purchase on the jeans. The cool thing is that, you know, all this is actually live on the website. It's part of an A-B test right now that we're doing. So, you know, your experience might vary when you go on the website, depending upon if you're the controller test group, but you can go and try it out on the Levi's website. It's all there. And uh, the final thing I'll end up with uh, from my side is that, uh, 
you know, really, uh, when you think about recommender systems and building any machine learning application, I think a lot of times we get very uh, sort of excited about, as data scientists and machine learning engineers, we get really excited about uh, the technology. But I think really, as uh, Chaitanya said in the beginning, we have to start with the consumer experience and work backwards to the technology. And I think that's really what ends up giving you the best consumer experience. So with that, I'll hand off to, uh, I think, Chaitanya. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pallav. That was a fascinating and interesting journey through the recommender system land and algorithms. And thanks a lot for giving us a glimpse behind the scenes actions of running a real-time recommender system in production. So we have a few questions and I'll give you like a few minutes to breathe and I'll direct my first question to data Iku will um, So with this these kinds of projects that are being executed would would it make sense to Simply hire an expert who can complete the full cycle of a data project uh, Yeah, I think that uh, it's definitely tempting uh, to think about kind of this unicorn data scientist a machine learning engineer um, but I think the, the way we see it uh, at data Iku is, is that you, know, you already have a lot of talent on your own team and, and maybe that talent doesn't have a PhD in machine learning but that talent does know your data uh, and they do understand the business needs so I think I would recommend you know really looking internally first at your team and then thinking about uh, the breadth of great technological solutions out there uh, you know AWS and data IQ being some of them, but you're right, there are others as well. So I would say look there first, um, and then if you feel like it's it's really a skill problem internally and you need to bring on others, then go there. But but first try to leverage what you got. Thank you. Um, how did you, uh, could you please talk about how did you leverage AWS to enable M machine learning at scale? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, one thing that should be noted again about the Data IQ data science platform is our um, agnosticism with regards to storage and compute. Uh, so we're a platform that enables all these individuals to, co to come together to do things exactly like what Paul just described. Um, but so in terms of some of the AWS services that we work with, so if you're looking for, for instance, data storage, well, you're probably going to think about SQL databases like Redshift or RDS. Um, or more broadly, if you just want some sort of object store, of course, we integrate with things like S3. Uh, and then once you have access to your organization's data, uh, you're gonna need to run jobs. So we oftentimes will you know, think about probably single node model training um, on a data IQ server. But if you're looking to do something else um, in terms of training, we also integrate with things like AWS ECS, so containers, elastic container services, um, or more broadly, thinking about running training on uh, EKS, so using AWS's Kubernetes services. Um, and then also, it should be noted too that uh, AWS's EMR, so Elastic MapReduce, um, is something that many of our clients will use to leverage AWS's Spark capabilities um, and Hadoop capabilities. Thank you. Uh, one, one more for you, and then we'll uh, uh, get to Pallav. Um, so an inclusive and collaborative environment being, brings many people into the mix on a data project. How would you suggest monitoring the transformation of changes uh, made by all these people during the project lifetime? Uh, great question. So I think if you want to think about monitoring and tracking changes and kind of broader data science governance, uh, there's a few things that you need to do. Uh, so first of all, you need to have the technical ability to do it. And so in Dataiku, we give you one shared platform where individuals are all collaborating and working together. And obviously we have rigorous um, uh, change tracking and version control capabilities within our platform. So whatever sort of technological solution you're using, you need to have the ability to uh, very literally track those changes and understand who's doing what and when. Uh, and so we definitely enable that. But I think also one thing that we find, or I should say our clients find, is that this is very much a human process as well. So you also need to have uh, human organizational protocols in place about how you make decisions, how you track these changes, how you promote work from kind of a dead dev test prod environment. Um, and so I think it's kind of a two-pronged approach. Do you have the technology in place and then have you done the thinking internally to really be rigorous about uh, 
project monitoring um, and project deployment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, Pallav, um, how did you measure the improvement on your journey through various versions of recommended systems at Levi's? Yeah, that's a great question, Chaitanya. So uh, I think one of the first things we looked at was the actual performance of the, the recommended system and performance here, meaning sort of more in terms of latency, error rates, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, and so that was like, I would say primarily what we we're looking at because we have pretty, uh, uh, you know, clear requirements from the front end team about, you know, what the performance needs to be and how it, how much it impacts the, the page load times, et cetera. So that was one area of it. The other area of it was to uh, actually have our merchandising team, our product team, our marketing team, and all the people who uh, you would say are like sort of more um, sort of conversant with our product uh, products and uh, sort of have a have some kind of a visual understanding of what the what the experience looks like, and then also our store associates have them use it and see you know you know as they browse like see if the recommendations are actually reflecting to a certain extent what they would have you know recommended. Now obviously nobody has an you know has a view of the entire product catalog and so we also looked at sort of is there like that amount of serendipity there the other thing that we also did so that was like more on the qualitative side then on the quantitative side we looked at uh, i think our primary metrics were intra similarity uh, and also co uh, you know coverage catalog, catalog coverage and so for example uh, if uh, you know if somebody browses uh, you know three items which are similar how similar are their items you know, in the recommendations? And because we have the features, we can actually then measure that. And then on the other hand, if I have browsed uh, sort of a, a wide variety of things, how much of the catalog coverage can I actually obtain uh, in there? And uh, we also looked at other metrics like uh, mean average precision and uh, like NDCG, et cetera. But I think those were, uh, to a certain extent, they were not necessarily as indicative of our, of our, of our of the recommendation system's performance because we had to add in other factors like diversity of products and you know sort of adding some of the other rules uh, from the business side which would be let's say things like you know don't show um, you know discounted items at the in the in, on the home page for example and that so then we couldn't necessarily like constrain our train our algorithms just based upon those metrics so it was uh, we just kind of used uh, I would say intra similarity and uh, catalog coverage in terms of the more algorithmic metrics thank you this uh, i think this is turning out to be a very nice um, benchmark system of how real world recommended systems function how they evolve and uh, uh, how the metrics evolve with the business uh, business problem that that's really great thank you pallav um one more please um do you use this recommendation system to launch and feature new products or uh, make changes to existing products uh, no, at this point, we don't necessarily look at it uh, in terms of launching new products uh, because, again, at the end of the day, uh, if a new product is something that a consumer might be interested in, then yes, it's a great way to show that. But we do uh, factor into account the newness of a product. So let's say, you know, when we're doing popularity-based, uh, you know, uh, recommendations, you know, if a product was just launched yesterday, there's no way it could have the same amount of clicks and views, et cetera. So we do factor into account the newness and uh, the business users can actually provide a, a boosting uh, sort of uh, uh, score for products that uh, we can then use to say that, okay, this product was launched yesterday. Uh, it's fairly new, but business wants to promote it. So we'll boost it up. But unless it actually does fit into the person's taste, we don't necessarily, uh, you know, just show it just because it's a new product. So we try to keep it, we try to, it's a fine balancing act between keeping the business happy and keeping the consumers happy as well sometimes. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to end with a question to uh, Will again. And now I'd like to switch industries for a bit and move on to the FSI vertical. So the question is, uh, security and governance can become an issue in certain industries, that is finance, um, in including various members of a team. How do you remain inclusive uh, in these industries? Yeah. Great question. Uh, I guess I would kind of answer in two ways. So I think uh, maybe at the heart of this question is the idea that when you have strict security and governance uh, standards that, you know, allowing too many people 
can lead to security breaches. And so I guess, first of all, of course, you need to have security, right? So first of all, things like secure data storage. So if we think about the AWS world, right, who has permission to what S3 bucket, of course, you need to have those roles rigorously defined within your organization. Uh, and then, you know, with regard to permissions and computation, uh, you need to have fine grain per user permissions on the data and on the compute resources. And so a platform like Dataiku will enable administrators to, you know, dig into the weeds and make sure that at a fine grain level, uh, user A and user B can only see uh, what the organization so intends. Uh, so that's no doubt important. But I also do think, again, that this call to inclusivity, even in these, uh, well, say, sensitive industries, I think the call to inclusivity is still appropriate, right? So I think we are aware of some of the ways in which AI has has uh, misstepped in the past. So if we think about the ways in which potentially, you know, biased AI solutions can be deployed and that can really be counter um, adding business value and adding value to our society. We definitely, I think, all want to avoid these things going forward. And so the more you have people in the room, I think the more we're going to add these appropriate checks and balances. So at DataIQ, we definitely understand uh, the need for appropriate security, governance, and, and restriction of access. But at the same time, the more you can give the right people the ability to collaborate, and I think the more we're going to lead to solutions that really benefit others as opposed to potentially having this uh, unanticipated but adverse effect. Thank you, Will. Um, it, it sounds like a well thought out, well engineered and uh, a product that is evolving continuously and uh, doing all the right things. Thanks a lot for taking us through that. Um, in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, you all for attending today's webinar. I would like to especially thank Pallav Agrawal from um, Levi Strauss and uh, and Co uh, for taking a, for for taking us through a tour of the recommender systems in production, and I would like to thank Will Novak from Data IQ for uh, for taking us uh, through a tour of. Uh, data IQ platform and its capabilities and answer and to both of them for answering uh, our questions in, in, in a detailed and thoughtful manner. Uh, we look forward to supporting you in current and future projects. Thank you again and have a great day.